Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending the COVID-19 webinar. My name is Nico Samaniego. I'm the Business Development Coordinator at the Erie County Economic Development Corporation. With me today, we have Abby Bemis. She's the Executive Director of the Erie County Economic Development Corporation. McKenna Lacer, Business and Communication Manager at Firelands Forward. And Madeline Davis, Interim Director of Community Health at the Erie County Health Department. Today's agenda will consist of a brief overview of the Erie County Economic Development Corporation, some economic development highlights from the past year, valuable insight to the local workforce, uh, a clear explanation of the current state of COVID-19 in our community, as well as the updated guidance and various resources available. The Erie County Economic Development Corporation as a whole focuses on three key areas. Workforce development headed by our Firelands Forward Division, startup and small business assistance led by our RISE program, and specialized business assistance focused on by our business development staff. There are many different metrics we use to track the economic development in our county. Uh, we refer to the three data points on the left as the big three. These are what we consider outcome measures. These numbers depict the outcome of our efforts to improve the local economy. On the right, you will see a pie, uh, a pie chart that shows the breakdown of the various assistance programs we have been able to facilitate over 2021. These programs assist growing businesses in our community and often require commitment to increase the number of employees and capital investment from the business itself. McKenna Lacer from Firelands Forward will now walk you through the workforce portion of the webinar. Yes, thank you, Nico. Um, so I wanted to kind of go through a couple of our measures that we have here. Um, unemployment is one that Firelands Forward as a workforce development office um, that's hosted through ECADEC, we kind of keep an eye on quite heavily. And we've started to see it stabilize near the end of the year um, to the point where what the Federal Reserve would consider full employment, which is between that four and 5% range. Uh, as you can see, that blue line there is indicating the Erie County results, and there was a slight peak throughout the middle of summer, and we just think that that was due to the impact that COVID-19 had on tourism and hospitality without, with, or throughout the county. You know, we think about Cedar Point, Kalahari, Great Wolf Lodge, hotels sporadically placed throughout the county, uh, so obviously that kind of led to that slight increase in the unemployment rate. And then we kind of switch over to the unemployment insurance claims. Next slide, please. Uh, and we kind of see through the CUI claims, um, generally they decrease throughout the year, which reflects the goes hand in hand with, with that unemployment data. There was a slight uh, spike throughout January of 2021, as well as May. The May incident was based off of the war notice that was placed through a local factory within the area. And for those of you that don't know, companies typically file a war notice to alert the local job and family services off office when they plan to lay off 50 or more employees. And that just kind of um, drives them to those dislocated workers and gets them back into the workforce as quickly as possible to allow them to recover from that. Um, so now we kind of switch off to the labor force participation rate and as a workforce development office this participation rate continues to be a major concern uh, you know we see it rising throughout the summer which is great and then towards the end of it for some reason we also saw a downward trend to below 60 percent and so as this next slide depicts there was an increase in job postings right so as 
industries are booming, productivity rates are increasing, you know, we're seeing that increase in job postings, but as the labor force participation rate decreases, there's that gap going on that can cause that employment to buckle. Uh, so throughout all industries, some measures that is worth noting, the average job posting was about 18 days long, and the mean salary that was averaged around 46,000 annually, uh, both of those numbers are down from 2020 figures, which could be good that the job posting average is down. Um, however, that wage for salary um, marketed was down. So good and bad key takeaways going on here. But overall, I think we're pretty optimistic in what the industries are going to look like over the next couple of months and coming years. But that's all I have to report when it comes to the workforce development side of things. I'm going to pass it off to Maddie through the health department and she's going to go through her numbers. Hi everyone, I'm Maddie Davies um, and I work for the Erie County Health Department. I'm our interim director of community health and I'm also our public information officer. So I've sent out a lot of information throughout the past couple of years with the pandemic. Um, and do a lot with our social media, press releases, things of that nature. So I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit today about what we've seen over the past couple of years with COVID, as well as what we're kind of seeing recently, um, some of the new guidelines that have been released, as well as what you guys as businesses can be doing to make sure that you're taking all of the necessary precautions. So over the past two years, Within Erie County alone, we've had just over 19,000 cases of COVID that have been reported to us. We've had um, nearly 1,300 hospitalizations and 278 deaths within the county. Um, all of those numbers are very staggering, and that can be kind of hard to put into perspective within the last two years. But if we go to the next slide and we look at what we've seen within just the last month and a half, so we've seen this huge spike in cases recently with the new Omicron variant. Um, we've seen a lot more community spread recently. It seems to be spreading more quickly and reaching more people than what we've seen before. So within the last month and a half alone, just December to this past week, we had nearly 6,000 cases. So 6,000 of that 19,000 cases have happened in the last month and a half. We also had 200 hospitalizations and 17 deaths. And then if we go to the next slide, I do a weekly press release, a joint press release with Ireland's hospital. So we go through what they're currently seeing as a hospital. Um, just this past week, they had 145 patients at Ireland's and that's for various reasons, not just COVID, uh, but they had 40 different COVID patients that were being treated at the hospital and 25 of them were unvaccinated. They, in total, throughout the um, depth of the pandemic, have had almost 1,400 COVID-positive patients that have been discharged and 154 total deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. If we go to the next slide. So CDC had just released uh, some new guidelines for individuals, either if you have COVID or if you've been in close contact with somebody who's had COVID. So previously, if you tested positive, you were supposed to be isolating for 10 days um, and making sure that those symptoms have reduced. Now what the recommendations are is if you've tested positive, you should stay home for five days, isolate yourself from anybody within your family, not leave your house. Um, and then after those five days, as long as your symptoms have resolved or they're starting to resolve, you're then able to leave your house. But for the next five days, you should continue to wear a mask around anybody that you come in contact with. Um, and if you do have a fever or those symptoms haven't resolved after the fifth day, you should stay home until those symptoms start to resolve. If we go to the next page, yes, thank you. Um, the quarantine guidelines have also changed. So if you've come in contact with somebody who is positive for COVID, here's what you should do. And there's gonna be a couple of different guidelines. It'll be dependent upon sort of what your status is. So if you have either completed your vaccine series within the past six months, so either Pfizer or Moderna, 
or you've completed J and J within the past two months, or you've been completely boosted, you don't have to stay home if you've come in close contact with somebody, but you should wear a mask around individuals that you come in contact with for 10 days. And if possible, um, test on day five, just to see if you might be somebody who's asymptomatic. But if you do develop symptoms after you've been in contact with somebody, you should stay home, follow those isolation protocols and get tested to make sure if that's what it is or if it's the cold or flu or whatever it might be. If we go to the next page, these are our continued quarantine guidelines. So if you have gotten vaccinated either through Pfizer, Moderna or J&J, &J, but you're outside of either that six month period or outside of that two month period for J&J, &J, or you aren't vaccinated at all. If you come in close contact with somebody, you should stay home for five days. And then after that quarantine period of staying home, continue to wear the mask for five days. So this is very similar to the isolation guidelines. And then again, if you do develop those symptoms, make sure that you get tested and you're staying home. And then some resources that we have for local businesses, what we're recommending right now, just with the increased spread that we're seeing, we're recommending that everybody's wearing masks regardless of your vaccination status. Um, and we always say that any mask is better than no mask, but recently the CDC has sort of been straying away from cloth masks and they're now recommending either those surgical masks, N95s or KN. KN95s, those are what's going to get you the best protection. If you haven't been vaccinated yet, oh, we're obviously recommending that. That's going to be your best form of protection right now. Um, we're offering vaccines here at the Erie County Health Department and our community health center for anyone over the ages of five. We have all three vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J. &J, and we're offering boosters, first doses, and those pediatric vaccines. If you need to call to schedule an appointment for any of those, the number's on the screen there. And we're also offering testing services as well. So if you're sick, please stay home and get tested to make sure what it is. We offer drive up testing here at the health center. So it's really convenient. You drive up to the health department, you stay in your car, one of our nurses will come out and test you. And we're offering um, PCR testing here for the time being. There are at-home tests available within the county. I know um, the uh, Postal Service was just offering, I think, four free at-home tests for anybody or for each residence, I believe. So those are nice to keep on hand if you need it. Um, we do recommend that you get a PCR test. It is a bit more accurate than those at-home tests, and those at-home tests need to be proctored by either a nurse or a physician, so that can be a little bit difficult uh, to do. So we recommend going to a testing facility, but those at-home tests are nice to keep on hand in case you need. And that's all that I have. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to let me know. We do have a few questions in the chat box. Uh, everyone attending, please feel free to use the Q&A portion to ask any questions for either the Erie County Economic Development Corporation staff, file and forward staff, or the Erie County Health Department. Uh, Maddie, this first one is for you. Would you elaborate on how vaccinated people do test negative using an at-home test, but test positive if it is a PCR test? Yes, absolutely. So that's sort of the point that I was getting at um, with the PCR test being a bit more accurate. Oftentimes you can get either a false positive or a false negative on an at-home test because it's harder, it can be harder to detect. So say somebody might be showing some symptoms of COVID or any flu-like symptoms, they use one of the at-home tests and they test negative on it. So they think that they don't have COVID when in reality they might actually. Those PCR tests are more accurate. So they're able to pick up and detect whether or not you have COVID more accurately. 
Um, Sue had also asked, uh, she said that somebody that she knows is at home. She's vaccinated and boosted, but she states that she's too weak to get to her car to be tested at the health department and asked if we offer or if we go to individuals homes. We don't currently do that right now. Um, we might be able to see if we can get her some at-home tests or maybe she can reach out to somebody she knows to get an at-home test but we don't do um, home visits right now for testing. Okay, and Maddie, uh, another follow-up question from Sue. Her at-home test says that she is negative. It might be one of those scenarios where um, it's, a, it's a false negative on the at-home test. However, it, it could be something else. She could have the flu or a cold, or it could be something else as well. Okay. M Maddie, we do have a few additional questions that were sent to us through the chat. I, I can begin to read down the list if you'll be so kind as to shed some light on each of these. Uh, what does PCR stand for? Um, give me just a second. It stands for polymerase chain reaction. So that's the type of test. So there's two different types of tests that we use for COVID-19. So the one is a PCR test and the other is an antigen test. The antigen test, you might have also been called, heard them called rapid tests. So the PCR tests typically take a little bit longer. Um, it's, that's because it's more accurate. So it takes about one to two days to get those results back from the lab, whereas those rapid or antigen tests are quicker. They take about 15 minutes to an hour to get the results. But again, they're not as accurate as the PCR. Okay. Another question that I believe is in your wheelhouse. Could you please speak to the timing of testing with an at-home test and the five-day quarantine? Do you mean um, like how long it takes to get the test results for the at-home test? I believe that it takes, I believe it's more so like a rapid to where it takes about 15 minutes to an hour to get the results for the at-home test. And then, if you test positive on that test result, then you would be confirmed positive for COVID. You would isolate yourself for five days. So you would stay home, stay away from anybody, isolate yourself as much as possible. And then if you are symptomatic and those symptoms start to resolve, you're able to leave your home after day five. However, you should continue to wear your mask. Maddie, okay. might I add, I've heard some questions on when the best time to take a test is after exposure, or if you're, particularly if you're not symptomatic, can you elaborate on that a little? Yeah, it's an at-home test or a visit? That's probably what they were asking about. My apologies. Um, you should wait. So if you've been in close contact with somebody and you yourself are not experiencing any symptoms yet, but say your spouse or your partner is a confirmed case of COVID. You don't have any symptoms yet, but you obviously came in close contact with them. You should wait a couple of days to get tested. So you should wait until about day five to get tested. That's when it's going to be the most accurate to see if or not you have COVID. Um, so we, we usually recommend that you wait at least three to five days after your last, um, your most recent exposure with the person. Great. Uh, Abby, uh, this next question will be directed towards you. Are you aware of any funding available for indoor air quality improvement for commercial locations? That's a good question. Um, over the last couple of years, when different COVID relief packages were rolled out, those types of improvements and other safety enhancements were definitely targeted with the use of those funds. 
Um, to my knowledge, there aren't any current COVID relief packages still open for businesses, but there are your standard economic development assistance programs. So Adam, um, I would encourage you to reach out to Nico and myself to learn a little bit more about your business. Um, eligibility would depend on the amount of investment that requires your business location, um, the type of business that you're in. So happy to explore it. Great. Maddie, we have a few more questions for you. If a person tests positive and subsequently lose their sense of taste and smell, does that indicate Delta, vir Delta versus Omicron? or not necessarily? So that doesn't necessarily um, determine which variant it is. That's something that we've seen since the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, we saw it almost immediately. That's one of the sort of telltale signs that it's COVID. We don't see that in a whole lot of individuals though. That loss of taste and smell is actually due to nerve damage from the virus. And that's one of those symptoms that can take a lot longer to come back. Some people, we thought a couple of sort of case studies um, where their taste and smell has not come back due to that sort of long-term nerve damage, but it, it does not indicate whether it's Delta or Omicron. Another one for you, Maddie. Does close contact, does the definition of close contact change if parties were masked? So close contact, it, that's a little bit iffy. So typically we define close contact as someone who was less than six feet away from somebody, from the infected individual um, for a total of 15 minutes. It doesn't have to be consecutive 15 minutes. It could just be 15 minutes throughout the day. So say you were in one of your colleagues' offices for 10 minutes and then you went back in for another 10 minutes later on that day, your consecutive or your um, total exposure to them throughout the day would be about 20 minutes. So we would define that as a close contact. And I think really it depends on the type of mask that you're wearing. So if you're unmasked, you're definitely a close contact. If you are wearing um, like an N95 or um, like a KN95 or even a surgical mask, sometimes we wouldn't necessarily um, deem that to be a close contact. However, with the cloth masks, it's a little bit iffier. So sometimes we would consider that to be a close contact. And we just sort of, if it's, if they've been in close contact, but they are wearing a mask, typically we would tell somebody to continue to monitor themselves for symptoms, just to check and make sure that they actually didn't get infected. Very good. This next question I think is on a lot of people's minds. Uh, it's becoming more and more common in the workplace um, if an if a employee is exposed by his or her spouse, but is not symptomatic, what should an employer do? Should they send them home for five days? Should they have them masked up? What, so that's going to be based off of those new quarantine guidelines. So it's kind of going to depend on the individual's vaccination status. Um, if they are boosted or they just received their two dose series or the J and J within the certain time frame, it's okay for them to come to work, but they should be masked at all times within the workplace or whenever they're around people. And they need to make sure that they're monitoring themselves for those symptoms for the full 10 days. Now, if um, they are either unvaccinated or they're outside of that six month range for the Pfizer or Moderna or the two month range for the J&J &J, and they haven't been boosted yet, then they're supposed to stay home for five days. So say that they came in close contact with their infected spouse on Sunday, they need to stay home throughout that full work week. And then as long as they don't accrue any symptoms, they're able to come back after that day five, but they, again, they should be wearing the mask for an additional five days. Okay. Hi, 
hope that we've been able to answer all of your questions. Uh, I know on behalf of our office and, and the Erie County Health Department, we appreciate your attendance and, and curiosity as to what best practices should be implemented to keep our community as safe as possible. Uh, if there are no other questions, I'd like to thank our panelists, our hosts, uh, and everyone for attending. This webinar will be downloaded and downloaded and uploaded onto our YouTube page. Uh, we will also download the slide deck and email it out to all of the registrants. If there are any other follow-up questions that we can answer or assistance that our office or the health department can provide, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much, Maddie. I really appreciate you joining us for this. Not a problem. Thank you so much for having me. I also, the guidance that I provided today during the PowerPoint, we have that in a flyer form. So if possible, I can send that over um, to ECADAC and you guys can send that out to some of the regist registrants too. That might be helpful for all of our local businesses. Absolutely. That would be great. All right. Well, everyone, I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you again so much for attending.